Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're not subscribed to this podcast, I'd encourage you to do so with your favorite podcast software, including TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. I do want to let you know about the Christmas programming we have coming up on our Old Time Radio podcast. We'll be having our sole new Christmas episode for 2022 coming up on Saturday on Tales of the Texas Rangers. Starting today on the amazing world of radio, we have four straight days of Christmas programming for your listening pleasure. Check those out at amazing.greatdetectives.net. Over at otrwesterns.com, Andrew Rines is doing 25 Days of Christmas. And if you want to catch any of our past year's Christmas episodes to discover something new or to re-listen to an old favorite, you can do so over at christmasfeed.greatdetectives.net. Well, over the next four weeks, we are going to be redoing a short series that we played about uh, nine or ten years ago, most of it, when we were... First, doing the five-part Johnny Dollar serials, we took a 15-minute series, including Dr. Tim, and what we would do is we would, with the five-part Johnny Dollar stories, we would do two parts each on Monday and Wednesday, and then on Friday we would do part five, and then we would do a 15-minute episode of something else, and Dr. Tim was one of those something else's. However, as a result of that, it means that if folks want to get on our Forgotten Detectives feed and listen to Dr. Tim Detective, they have to listen to the fifth part of a Johnny Dollar serial, which we don't have parts, you know, one through four in the feed. So that's a little bit inconvenient for them. And so we've got a total of eight episodes and we'll play uh, two of them each week for four weeks so we can enjoy this kind of interesting and quirky series. I also have to say that we know a bit more about Dr. Tim Detective than we did when I played this back in 2014. When I played it, I had no idea where it came from. And I marked each of the episodes as having originally aired in 1948. And I learned that this was not true at all. There's been uh, some efforts to try to date the series. Now, the Digital Deli FTP.com has got a log of the series that is based on a September 1950 launch date in Rockford, Illinois, over station WROK. That run of the series was sponsored by the Winnebago County Medical Society, uh, along with uh, Central Illinois Electric and Gas Company and the station. Now, this is an interesting log, but this is not actually the earliest air date of the series. And the series was not uh, something that originated in Illinois, nor did it originate in Hollywood, nor did it originate in New York. found an article in the Fort Collins, Colorado, from February the 17th of 1950, which announced the beginning of the series over radio station KCOL, and to start the Monday following, which was February the 20th. The series was sponsored by the Colorado State Medical Society and the Larimer County Medical Society, and the article contains this note, the script of Dr. Tim Detective was produced for school-age listeners by the Rocky Mountain Radio Council. So what we are going to hear today is old-time radio drama produced in Colorado. Though sadly, we have no information on the stars. Now, when I am giving the dates for when episodes aired, 
because I don't have a detailed log of the series, I'm going to assume that the Colorado run was aired in the same order as the later Rockford run. That could be wrong, but we're going to go with it for now. A lot of introduction, but this is kind of an obscure series, so I appreciate your patience. But now let's go ahead and to two episodes of Dr. Tim Detective. The original air dates, February 27th and March the 6th, 1950. And the titles of the episodes, Mystery of the Mad Maltese and The Guest in Number 2. This is Dr. Tim, Detective, to bring you by transcription, The Mystery of the Mad Maltese. The Mystery of the Mad Maltese is one of the most exciting cases I've ever had anything to do with. You see, a man's life actually hung on the slender thread of time. And that man had disappeared, as completely and utterly as if the earth had opened up and swallowed him. But let me start at the beginning. You see, I'm a sort of combination detective and medical doctor. This particular morning, I was in the midst of a complicated experiment in my laboratory, having to do with testing some material for blood stains. Just as I set the bubbling liquid aside to cool, I heard a commotion outside my window. I recognized the voices of my good friends Sandy and Jill. Jill's my landlady's daughter, and Sandy is one of the kids down the street. Both of them have helped me on a lot of cases. I couldn't imagine what was going on, so I raised the window and called out. Hey, you kids, what's up? I thought you came something awful happened. We're trying to catch a big old cat. He's gone crazy or something, I guess. Well, Rocky, this Jackson man something terrible, and he didn't want to My heart jumped up in my throat as I called through the window. Get out of that yard and stay out. Don't you go near that animal. But gee, Dr. Tim, he might be dangerous. He might hurt some little kid. Without stopping to argue, I grabbed up the nearest thing I could lay my hands on. It happened to be my top coat and dashed out into the yard. Gee, Dr. Tim, what's the matter? Get back, both of you. Let me handle this. In a moment, I had the cat, a huge Maltese, backed up into a corner of the fence. And holding my top coat before me the way a bullfighter handles his cape, I threw it over the furious animal. In a few seconds, had it bundled up in such a way that the cat could neither bite nor scratch. Followed by Sandy and Jill, I rushed the cat into the laboratory and dumped it into a wire cage. Exhausted, the cat stretched out, white saliva dripping from its rigid jaws. I tossed the coat into a corner away from all of us and then looked at my hands. There was no sign of a cut or scratch on them. I heaved a big sigh of relief. Jill, big-eyed with fright, spoke first. Gee, where's Dr. Tim? What's wrong? I'm not sure, Jill, but I'm afraid it's rabies. I'm almost certain that cat is mad. A few minutes later, I was getting the whole story from Sandy and Jill. And while we were playing out in the yard, and this man came walking up the street. Gosh, I don't know where the cat came from, but... When the man came along, the cat dashed out into his seat, and he stooped down to push it away. And then the cat had sort of a fit or something, and it bit him on the hand. So we ran up and chased the cat into the backyard, and when we got back, the man was gone. Sandy, Jill, you know what rabies is, don't you? You mean like a mad dog? This is a cat. Well, now, cats can have it, too. So can squirrels and rats and, well, a lot of animals. Wolves, coyotes, or... Gee, where do you mean? Hi, Joe. Hydrophobia that makes you go mad? I'm afraid I do, Jill. What about the man he bit? What'll happen? Unless we can find him, and find him in time, he'll die one of the most horrible deaths known to a human being. Now, you kids, are you sure you didn't touch that cat? Mm-hmm. Right, I know. No, good enough. And you're sure the cat bit the, the mysterious stranger? Yes. Yeah. Well, then first of all, I have to make sure the cat really is rabid. Oh. You see, rabies is a virus. A deadly agent so small that it can't be seen even with a microscope. So some very complicated tests are necessary. However, in my mind, there's no doubt that the cat has rabies. How do you know? Well, from the way it acts, Sandy. Any animal that bites can always be suspected of having the disease. That means that if you're bitten, the biting animal should immediately be put under observation. Well, what about the man who bit? First, we have to find him. 
Then he'll be given a series of inoculations, injections, with a material known as a vaccine. But can I find the man? Jill, we're going to have to turn detectives again. I'm afraid we'll have to stage a manhunt, and time is the most important thing. Those treatments have to begin as soon as possible, or nothing, nothing in the world can save that man from dying. Now let's start tracking him down. There wasn't very much to go on. Jill and Sandy both agreed that the man was a stranger in the neighborhood. He wore a blue suit, a felt hat, was about 50 years old, and he carried a bag, as Jill explained. Well, it was sort of, sort of like the bag you carried, Dr. Kim, with all mm. your medicine and things in it. Mm. Only bigger. Well, a suitcase? No, it wasn't a suitcase. Whiz, I wish I could remember more. I remember you said it. An average-looking man of 50 carrying a bag. Not much to go on. But we all got busy. Sandy and Jill and I went all over the neighborhood. We rang doorbells. We talked to housewives, always asking if they had seen anyone who looked like the man bitten by the rabid cat. No one had. That meant he wasn't a salesman or a visitor in the neighborhood or a boarder in any of the rooming houses around. There was only one thing left to do, and that was to send out a general alarm. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Be on lookout for man bitten by cat with rabies. Will have claw marks on left wrist and hand. Was last seen carrying small handbag in the neighborhood of Grant and Eleven. <laughs> And here's an urgent bulletin. Somewhere there is a man who has been bitten by a rabid cat and probably doesn't realize his danger. If that man is listening, or if any of our listeners know him, he should be taken at once to the nearest hospital. Only prompt treatment can save his life. Now, here's the story. Every doctor in town, every doctor in the state, was asked to report at once anyone who appeared for treatment of scratches and bites. But no one answering his description had been heard of. By that evening, we were at a dead end. Time was running short. Time, that important factor in treating rabies. With every hour, our chances of saving the unknown man's life lessened. As we sat around and tried to think of some new way to find our man, we were certainly a dejected crew. Gosh, Dr. Kim, you think somebody'd be able to locate him. Especially with that statewide alarm out. And I suppose by now the story's gone over the whole country. What did you do with the cat, Dr. Kim? No, the health department came out and got him this afternoon. Are they are they sure? You know. Mm, I'm afraid so. It's rabies, all right. Gosh, white animals have to go and get things like that. Oh, that's life, Sandy. We doctors have been working for thousands of years to conquer disease. But we've barely made a beginning. Well, of course, human carelessness has a lot to do with it, too. How? Well, rabies could be completely wiped out if... If what? If people would just use their heads. You see, rabies can be prevented. You mean something could have been done to keep that cat from going mad? Of course. Just in exactly the same way that you and Jill will never get smallpox. Because you were vaccinated against it. And because you continue getting vaccinated every few years just as a safety measure. Do they vaccinate dogs and cats, too? Oh, sure they do. In some places, it's the law that all pets which might develop rabies must be immunized. Hey, that's a swell idea. Well, they'll always be strays. But the first thing to do is to stay away from animals you don't know. You don't even have to be bitten to get rabies. What do you mean? If you have a cut or a scratch, just handling the animal might infect you. Uh, did you notice what I did to that coat of mine that I used to capture the cat? Oh, I did. You wouldn't let me touch it. Then you wrapped it up in heavy paper and... Well, why did you do that? Because the cat infected it. It was hissing and spitting and slobbering all over the coat. And anyone touching those places with a cut or scratch might get the infection. Gosh, we sure had a close shave chasing after that cat. You'll never know how close. Well, kids, getting late. Not much more we can do tonight. Sweet, I'll him. I feel like we sure let you down. 
Not remembering more about what that man looked like. Yeah. Oh, it can't be helped. I probably couldn't have remembered much more myself. And I've been trained as a detective. Well, I've been thinking there was something different about him, and I don't know what it was. There was something about his clothes, I think. Oh, darn. A vague idea was beginning to form in my head. But it was crowded out by visions of what that unknown man was going to be in for if we didn't find him in a hurry. It might be a week, a month, maybe longer, when he'd begin to feel restless. There'd be an unaccountable sense of terror, irritation. I could almost see it. in my horror-struck thoughts, but I hardly noticed what Sandy and Jill were saying until... No, it wasn't, Sandy. It was sort of an old-fashioned coat. Not like the one my dad wears or Dr. Tim. Well, that's what I meant, sort of. Well, there was something shining. I remember it because when we ran out in the walk, something flashed in my eyes. It was on his coat. Wait a minute, Sandy. I think I'm beginning to remember. Button, that was it. Brass button. Dr. Tim, he had brass buttons, eh? Oh, 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 I'm sorry, kids. I Dr. Didn't Tim... You. The man who was bitten, what he wore was like a uniform. Uh, only it wasn't exactly. Now, hold on a minute. Are you sure? Absolutely. Are you sure? A policeman? I'm sure it wasn't a policeman. Or a bus driver? No, no, no. The brass button was there. A handbag. Button. No uniform cat, though. Handbag. Only in a town, obviously. Button. 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 I've got it! Sandy, Jill, we've got our man! Let me get that telephone quick! His life is saved! About an hour later, the phone rang. Well, Doc, we've found him. Yes, yes, that's right. He's a conductor on the Chicago run. Yeah, a train's just pulling into Ivyville now. An ambulance is meeting him. He'll be given his first injection inside 30 minutes. Nice work, Doc. And congratulate those kids for me, too. They're smart youngsters. Well, thanks, and so long. <sighs> That's that. Was he really a railroad conductor? Did they find him on the train? He was, and they did. And a nicer piece of detective work I've never known. It was all your doing, kid. But how did you know? Yeah, I didn't even get hep till you telephoned the railroad station. Well, when you have all the pieces, you can put them together and get a picture. A man in a sort of uniform, as you called it. Brass buttons, a small grip, like a doctor's, only bigger. That narrowed the field down a lot. And then, just as I was beginning to get somewhere, one of those fool accidents happened. One of those crazy things that make all the difference in the world. I heard a train whistle in the distance. All of a sudden, I knew... And that's the story. Being a combination of doctor and detective gets pretty rugged sometimes, and this was one of those times, all right. The guest in number two, we called him. Jill, that's my landlady's daughter, first called him to my attention. Mom's just friend in number two. You know, the room up on the second floor. To the dog gone guy. Hmm. I remember you thought I was the dog gone guy when I moved in here and set up a laboratory for crime detection and medical work. Well, but Sandy thinks so too, don't you, Sandy? 
Yeah, I think maybe he's a criminal in hiding. <laughs> I'm afraid you kids have developed unnatural suspicions from helping me out with some of my cases. Well, anybody that says his name is Jones... Is name. <laughs> oh, now, look. Some people really are named Jones. Several hundred thousand of them, I presume, and that's Yeah, but all. if that's his name, then why are all his suitcases marked with R-W-M? Sure, every one of them, stamped in gold letters. None of our business, kids. Boy, your mother'd skin you alive, Jill, if she knew you were prying into the luggage of a paying customer. And as for you, Master Sandy, it might be smart for you to confine your detective work to your own premises and not in other people's houses, right? Right. Oh, okay, I guess. But I still think it is darn good. I wish now I'd paid more attention to Sandy and Jill in the matter of the stranger in number two. But you never know until it's too late. Anyway, nothing happened to break the routine of my laboratory week for a couple of weeks. Then, late one afternoon, just before dinner time, I was cleaning up my lab. Hey, Dr. Tim. You don't mean those jars are full of real blood. Blood from people. Exactly that, Joe. What do you do with it? Oh, a lot of things. Blood's a pretty useful thing, a lot more so than most people realize. Where do you get it? From the bank, Jill, the blood bank, and that's just what it actually is. All over the country, these banks keep blood for use whenever and wherever it's needed. Sure, but what do you do with it? Well, that's a long story, Sandy, but it amounts to this. For years, doctors have known that blood isn't just one thing. It's lots and lots of things, and each one of those parts or fractions of the blood can be separated from the other parts. And these are used to cure people. I'm trying to find some new blood parts, or some new uses for the old ones. That's why there's always blood samples in the laboratory refrigerator, Catch. Uh -huh. Sure. Well, I'm all cleaned up here at last. Now, what's the news? Mom said I'd better come up and see you. Hmm? A professional visit, she called it. I don't feel so good today. Hmm. Uh, symptoms? Well, I've been sort of sick in my stomach, and my eyes hurt, and I feel all kind of worn out. Personally, I think she's just trying to get out of doing homework tonight. I am not. Well, let me take a look, Jill. Now, stick out your tongue. Uh-huh. Say, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Sandy. Yes, Dr. Tim. Hand me that thermometer, will you? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'll keep it in your mouth for a while, Jill. Now, Dr. Tim. Yes? You know that guy Jones upstairs? Oh, I wouldn't say I know him, Sandy. We've spoken in the hall. Well, I know you told us to lay off, but the doggonest thing happened just a few minutes ago. Well, I was waiting by the stairs for Jill. Ah, the curse of an overactive imagination. Go on. Anyway, he came in with this other man right behind him. And Dr. Tim, I'd swear that other guy had a gun in his overcoat pocket, was pushing it right up against this Jones guy's back. They didn't see me. I didn't have time to laugh because just at that moment, from right overhead, came the sound of a fight. And then something else. A shot. For a moment, we stood there paralyzed. It wasn't until I heard a crash of glass and saw a figure hurtle past my window and streak it over the back fence and up the alley that I could move. And by the time that we reached the upstairs room, it looked as if we'd arrived too late. The mysterious Mr. Jones was lying on the floor with a pool of blood beside him. He'd been shot. Shot right through the back. Looking back on it afterwards, I don't know what I'd have done without those kids. There wasn't anybody else in the house. And if I ever needed six hands, I needed them then. Sick as she was, Jill just gulped and said, Holy gee, is he... is he dead? He wasn't quite. It was a matter of moments. Gunshot wounds can be pretty nasty. Where there's loss of blood, you always have shock to contend with. And shock can be mighty serious in itself. Sandy didn't have to be told. In a flash, he was downstairs and back with my medical bag. One word to Jill, the word police, sent her flying to a telephone, and I knew an ambulance and help would be on the way at once. Meantime, the mysterious Mr. Jones was in the hands of God and a doctor. I hoped I was a good doctor. And I remember asking God to help me out on that score. Jones was dying. Fast. Then I remembered that blood in my laboratory. <laughs> Downstairs in the lab, Jill and I worked as we'd never worked before, while Sandy kept watch upstairs over the wounded man. We didn't talk much, Jill and I, just a few quiet questions and answers. Here's the microscope, Dr. Tim. 
Are you going to give him a transfusion? Yes. Have to check his type of blood first with a microscope. Use the wrong kind of blood and it would kill him. Gee. Good thing I have whole blood on hand for those experiments. He wouldn't last until they could get some here. Now, that solution, please. Here. Ah, this one seems to match his blood. Quick, hand me that bottle marked type O. Now, go to the sterilizer. Twenty minutes later, the ambulance arrived. Two squad cars and a dozen or so police were scouring the neighborhood for some trace of the man who had tried to murder the mysterious Mr. Jones. And as for Jones, that blood had saved his life, had replaced the vital fluid, the blood cells, and all the other chemical elements so necessary to keeping the life of a man going. Jones was still unconscious, of course, and would be for a long time yet. His condition was so serious that he couldn't even be moved to a hospital. It would have meant sure death from more loss of blood and shock. The case was out of my hands now, but I'd done my best, and I hoped my best was good enough. I sank down weakly in a chair in my laboratory. And it wasn't until I noticed Sandy and Jill, big-eyed and bursting with excitement, that I remembered the other side of the affair. Who had shot Jones, and why? Maybe I could help there, too. But one look at Jill, and I knew her heart was going to be broken. For this was one case where she was going to be out of the running. I spoke quietly. Jill. Yes, Dr. Tim? You're going to bed. Oh, Dr. Tim! Hate to do it to you, old girl. But you remember that little examination we were making? Oh, well, yes, but... As your doctor, madam, I order you to bed. You have measles. A few minutes later, the house had two bed patients. One, a very sad young lady with measles. The other, a man nobody knew, who had almost been murdered. A third patient, Sandy, was standing up bravely under a light while I stood over him with a hypodermic syringe. What's the stuff, Doc? Well, believe it or not, Sandy, it comes from blood, too. It's going to keep you from catching Jill's measles. Or at least it'll make certain that you have a very light case and protect you for a long time afterwards. What do you call it? Immune serum globulin. Well, let's skip that one, huh? <laughs> well, you see, this stuff is one of those blood parts, fractions I was telling you about. When you take blood from people who have had measles and separate it into its parts, this globulin... Hey, how do you spell that one? Well, G-L-O-B-U-L-I-N. It works wonders to keep people from getting measles from other people. I'll take your word for it, Doc. Go ahead and shoot. Okay. Huh, I didn't even feel it. Am I safe now? Perfectly safe. Dr. Tim. Yes? You know, I've been watching that guy, Jones, the one who was shot. I can tell you something about him. What? He's loony. You know what he does? No. He collects rocks, believe it or not. Just common old rocks. Well, that's a harmless pastime. Sure got him in a mess of trouble. Maybe you've got a point there, Sandy. But why would anybody shoot a man for collecting rocks? Unless, well, unless they were gold or something. Whoever shot him was after those rocks, all right. When you left me alone with Mr. Jones in the room upstairs, I sort of... Well, sort of noticed that several of his suitcases had been busted open. There were rocks with labels on them scattered all over the room. I'd sure like to know why. It must have been midnight when I decided I couldn't get to sleep. and might as well do a little looking around. After what we'd all been through, I wanted to forget the mystery and relax. The police could carry on from here. But I couldn't. So I went up the stairs to where the mysterious Mr. Jones hovered between life and death. I motioned the nurse to be silent and carefully examined the room. Sandy was right. There was nothing of interest except the rocks. There were hundreds of them, all sizes and all shapes, and all neatly labeled with cryptic little stickers which said Northwest 100A or South G8, referring no doubt to some location on a map where they had been gathered. I took a couple with me to examine at leisure in the laboratory and started downstairs when I noticed a light coming from under the door to Jill's room. Come in. Well, sort of late for a sick girl to be reading, isn't it? Oh, honest, I've been asleep. Well, it's lights out now. Doctor's orders. Okay, doctor. How's Mr. Jones? Is he going to live? Mm, I wish I could tell you, Jill. The use of blood has given him a chance... First the transfusion, then later maybe you'll need plasma. What's that? 
Oh, plasma's another part of blood, Jill. It can be stored indefinitely and won't spoil as quickly as whole blood. You use it when you don't need the red cells of the blood, just the liquid part. Gee, blood is sure wonderful stuff. Mm-hmm. Of course, Dr. Jill, what are you doing with those rocks in your hand? Oh, these? Well, they're from Mr. Jones' room. Seems uh, to be a lot of them up there. Are they anything special? Mm, I don't know, Jill. Sandy mentioned them, and I thought... Gee, they... whiz. I'll bet I know what they are. I was reading in the paper tonight. Everybody's out looking for them. For what? Well, gosh, I forget what you call it. The prospectors go out with some kind of electric machines, and they... I just stood there with my mouth hanging open. What a dope I'd been. It took two kids to tell me what I should have seen from the very first moment. Without even saying goodnight to Jill, I dashed down the stairs, picked up the telephone, and called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. This was a case for the G-Man. It took a couple of weeks before the case was cleared up. My hunch, thanks to the work of Sandy and Jill, had been right. Jones had been prospecting for uranium, the vital mineral for atomic energy and research. Jones told us the whole story later, how he was prospecting for the government, which badly needed new supplies of uranium. How he'd been forced at the point of a gun to give up his map and then brutally shot. The chi men caught the man all right, but never gave out the whole story of who was behind the robbery and the attempted murder but there wasn't anyone working for the good of this country. Jones had really found uranium, too, and the mine is being worked today, thanks to Sandy, to Jill, and to a mysterious substance known for thousands and thousands of years as blood. This is Dr. Tim Detective saying so long until next week at this same time, when Sandy, Jill, and I will dip into my casebook and bring out a brand new transcribed story, The Mystery of the Man from Trouble Creek. Welcome back. Well, an entertaining first couple of episodes. Actually, the second and third of the series of 13. And even though it's written with school-age children in mind, it's smartly written. Uh, It's got a lot to do in about 14 minutes. Because it's got to cover the medical scientific issue while still telling a story And you've got to communicate things in a way that starts at the level uh, a child would understand at. I think that's pretty effective. Uh, The the guy who plays Dr. Tam, again, we don't know who he is, uh, is pretty good at what this character needs to be. He is kindly, but he's also uh, an authority figure. And I thought there was a really good example of that in the Mad Maltese uh, story when he really was firm in trying to stop uh, Sammy and Jill because they were in danger of getting infected with rabies. At the same time, he's human and makes mistakes. And you saw that in the second case where he blew them off about 
the guy who was in number two and uh, just assume they were letting their imaginations run away with them. And it's an interesting portrayal for a series uh, that's put out by medical societies where you're telling kids, you know, the doctor is someone you should listen to, he's smart, but he's human. He makes mistakes. It's a very mature way, I think, to write the series while still uh, working with kids. Because you have a series written for kids that does respect their intelligence and their ability to pick up on these sort of things. I thought the medical information was pretty well handled and pretty naturally, although it was pretty clear that the whole thing with uh, Jill getting uh, measles, was, uh, you know, that whole subplot was just so uh, that Dr. Tim could uh, discuss another aspect of blood. I'm, of course, not a medical professional, nor do I play one on TV, uh, but I, I think that the medical information sounded sound for, you know, 1950. I do know that we're not getting regular smallpox uh, inoculations anymore. So that part's not applicable. Now, of course, while this series was produced in uh, Colorado, the article in the Rockford paper shows that there was at least one other medical society that was interested in running it locally. A series like this, you know, with the quality of the writing, and I think the acting's pretty good, too. It could have been more widely syndicated. When I did some research, I did not find a whole lot of mentions of Dr. Tim in radio listings. And that may be because radio, and in particular children's radio, was already in decline. And so the school-age children that they w needed to reach were less and less likely to uh, be listening. And I think it would be a good long while before you got this level of quality in children's educational programming on television. Well, now it's time to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Bill, Patreon supporter since November 2020, currently supporting us at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Bill. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. You can subscribe with Spotify, Apple Podcast, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to rate the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. Next week, join us for an encore presentation from our archives, and Dr. Tim will return in two weeks. And in five weeks, we will be presenting the series Meet Miss Sherlock. But coming up tomorrow, listen for Dangerous Assignment, where... Yeah. Who's there? The guy you wanted to see. How can I be sure? Well, you might try opening the door. Uh, you alone? Yeah. Come on, open up, Gouda. You must not mention my name. Come in, quickly. Now, your credentials, please. Here they are. So, did anyone follow you here? Not that I know of. Why? I had to go out for a while this evening. I believe someone was following me, but I managed to give them the slip. Look, uh, what is this that you want to tell me? I was paid to give false testimony against the American, Carter. I see. Who paid you and why? They only gave me half the money they promised me. Who's they? The ones who really smuggled the weapons into Kualani province. They said if I tried to betray them, they'd kill me. But I will have my revenge. If, if I tell you their names, you must protect me from them. Oh, I'll do what I can. Very well. There, there are two of them involved. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. 
Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.